So a very warm welcome to this Wildlife Trust event this evening that's co-hosted by Berkshire Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust and the Wildlife Trust nationally. Um, now I'm going to introduce the panel, well they're going to introduce themselves uh, in a moment, but you all know why you're here. And um, we're going to be discussing uh, the UK context tonight, nature-based solutions in a UK context and how we can scale that up. So we're going to go to the panel first. Um, Catherine, would you like to introduce yourself? So yeah. You are. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Estelle. I'm Catherine Brown. I'm Director of Climate Change and Evidence at the Wildlife Trust, the national bit. Um, I have been at the conference today as well, and I'll be speaking there tomorrow. So I'll try to say different things tomorrow morning to what we're doing tonight. Um, but thank you, everyone who's been there all day and come along tonight. So hopefully the wine is helping um, with the lecture theatre atmosphere. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte Newberry. I am the Head of Landscape Recovery at Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. Hi, I'm Matt Buckler. I'm the Director of Natural Solutions at the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. Hi, I'm Helen Avery. I'm Head of Nature Programmes at the Green Finance Institute. Um, uh, you're the old one out. I'm sorry, we're all wildlife trust. I'm, uh, I'm assuming everybody's heard of the wildlife trust, have you? Do you know what we do? Well, yes. And we're all about bringing nature back, basically. So this is kind of a very core part of what we do. And as we look to the future, a really, really important part. Now, I've been watching online today and... Um, Oh gosh, I was actually, my head came away scrambled at the end of it because nature-based solutions clearly means different things to different people, whether it's a global north or global south. Um, so I just want to be very clear that we're actually just focusing on the UK tonight um, and the IUCN definition of that as well, which I will read to you so we're all super clear about that. So nature-based solutions address societal challenges through actions to protect sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems, benefiting people and nature at the same time. Yeah, and I've already talked about the global north and south, so I won't. So that's, that's the context in which we're talking about uh, this evening. Now look, um, I don't need to rehearse to you guys that uh, nature in this country, I mean, we are one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. I think we rank something like 212 out of 240. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm getting it, yeah. Um, which is a pretty dire place to be. So that's a big hole to climb out of, basically. Um, now, we know that nature plays a massive role in challenging and sorting out societal issues. Um, and the funding gap at the moment, again, you know, don't need to rehearse all of this, 40 to 90 billion, um, that will cost us up to 2030 to try to really start to turn nature recovery into action and start to really put the building blocks in place um, to start um, the whole process of nature's recovery. So we've got a long way to go. And yeah, can all of that, uh, with climate change and health and all of the other issues, societal issues rolled into that, it's a huge challenge and it's going to take um, a lot of effort from various partners to come together to do that, not least on a policy scale as well from government. Um, so a huge challenge in front of us as well. So... Okay, I think we're going to move into, um, hang on a sec, I'm going to turn my page over. So we've got, we're going to invite questions in a little while from you guys, but we do have some questions for the panellists now. Um, but as the, the Wildlife Trust, we're one of the, the largest landowners, I think we're seventh actually, Catherine, I'm looking to you to confirm this statistic. We are number seven. We are number seven, uh, largest landowner in the UK. Um, and I think that, you know, this, we've got a real opportunity here, massive opportunity to, to lead the conversation on nature-based solutions across the UK and actually to demonstrate how to do this in practice. So we're just going to start now then um, with a little bit of context setting uh, within that respect. So Catherine, do you want to just talk to us a little bit about the, the national policy approach to nature-based solutions? Yep, so we thought it would be useful just to set a little bit of UK context. I know a lot of today has been about global initiatives and, and theory and principles. Um, so we wanted to get a bit more practical and, and talk about how actually things are panning out in the UK. Um, my background is actually I worked for the UK government for 20 years before coming to the Wildlife Trust. So I was um, at DEFRA for 10 years, the Department for the Environment, and then at the UK's Climate Change Committee for 10 years. So I've done a lot of civil service in my time um, and seen how policy comes and goes and, 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 and changes and, and evolves. And it's, it's very interesting having worked in mainly in climate change, but always with a, with a nature focus. I was looking today 
back at some of our earlier policy documents to think when actually was the point at which things started to really change. And in particular, um, this government that we have at the moment set up something called a 25 year environment plan, at least covering England. And the first one of those was published in 2018 and had absolutely no mentions of nature based solutions or the word NBS at all in it, which I thought was very interesting. The concepts were there, but the terminology was completely missing. We had an updated one of those plans published last year in 2023. It was the one that was shown up on the screen today with the with the red squirrel on the cover. It had over 30 mentions of nature-based solutions. And I think it's only a 50 page document or something. So it really shows in that five year period, that's when the change has happened. And a lot of that has been driven by the international agenda and obviously by, by both the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and CBD which we heard a bit about today. Um, and we've heard as well today in the conference some of the, the difficulties and the challenges around the, the wording nature-based solutions. But certainly I think in the UK policy context, it has just been accepted that that's the terminology we use and we, and we use it very often in the UK. So you can see it's starting to come in through in policy, but I would also say it still feels very fragmented to me. So it, it's generally and most often um, talked about in the climate change context and particularly carbon related. And you can see that in most of the government's policy documentation. It does get picked up in other places as well. So um, in the plan I was just talking about, it gets picked up in relation to water and to farming. But there isn't really any kind of overarching vision or goal for nature based solutions in those policies. And we start to actually look outside and look to finance. I know Helen's going to pick this up to see where it's all coming together because you don't you don't necessarily see that coming through um, in a lot of the policy work. But the feeling is certainly there, and obviously it's it's almost become sorry this 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 is overly simplified, but it's become cool in the UK to talk about nature and climate together, to talk about nature-based solutions. But as we've heard today, and we'll talk about, you know, it, it might be cool to talk about it, but getting it done yeah. and done properly is is quite a different matter. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and Helen, to you. So what's the lay of the land then uh, with nature based solution? Yeah, and I'm going to sort of use a, I broaden out nature based solutions into sort of nature restoration. I think nature based solutions is pretty slim if you're thinking about it in terms of green infrastructure or, you know, climate. That's that, you know, if that's a terminology for nature based solutions that you think about. Um, so I tend to think about nature restoration. And um, so we have. Uh, several markets. So we talk a lot about nature markets, markets that can allow private sector finance to flow into nature restoration. So in the UK, we obviously have two compliance markets. We have biodiversity net gain, so the regulated markets, and then nutrient neutrality. Um, and then we have uh, voluntary markets or markets that are like, you know, we obviously have voluntary carbon, Woodland Carbon Code, Peatland Carbon Code. There are other carbon codes under development, Saltmarsh Carbon Code, Hedgerow Carbon Code. Um, there's more uh, and then we have things like natural flood management which is you know interventions put on on farms that reduce flood risk so not that's not quite a nature market but that's something that we're seeing some projects move through um, and then there's things like you know companies doing um, business resilience so some of the water utilities will lead in paying farmers to re reduce nutrient um, uh, their, their nutrient flows into waterways and then there's some CSR so corporate social responsibility where some companies are putting you know money into tree planting and things like that so it feels like there's a lot going on it feels really busy and the way we look at the green finance issue is we look at you know what's the demand um for these kinds of projects and sort of coming from the corporate side what's the supply so the farmers on the ground wildlife trusts other ngos and landowners providing that pipeline of projects that have a business case that they can sell a credit or a unit or just sell risk reduction or something and then the policy side so those three things have to all work together and it's a bit off kilter if i'm on it so we've had some investment readiness funds in the UK, which have been really helpful. Um, uh, two rounds in Scotland, three rounds in, in England. So we have quite a big pipeline. There's probably about 250 projects running through that pipeline. But what we haven't got so much of, and we can go into this later, is that real like, demand from the corporate side, other than in those two regulated markets. And you know, those are site specific. So I think there's a lot of discussion. We think it feels like money's moving, but actually how much money is moving, but probably not much at the moment. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much. Nema, I'm going to come to you now because it'd be great just to hear some kind of practical uh, work that, about practical work that you've been doing. Um, also, we're grassroots uh, organisations, so we're kind of pl very place-based. So, you know, trying to bring that to life would be great. And then we'll move to Charlotte after that. Yeah, so so um, in terms of my background, um, before I started the Wildlife Trust, I worked in the Peak District doing peatland restoration um, for the Moors for the Future Partnership. Um, and we did some, you know, massive landscape scale work to do, uh, which related to, a lot of which related to the work that the water companies wanted to do because they understood that it was actually in their interest to be doing peatland restoration. And, it, and, and so that was sort of where what got me into nature-based solutions and understanding um, that we can play quite big in, it, quite big societal impacts through the work that we're doing. Um, and our, our biggest sort of nature-based solutions project is um, called the Derwent Living Forest. Um, and what we're trying to do through that is to join up the Northern Forest and the National Forest um, from a from a, in a north-south hab habitat connectivity point of view, um, which is obviously really important in terms of uh, climate change adaptation for species. Um, and what we're trying to do is to create 30,000 hectares of new wooded landscapes. Um, and we know, you know, that's been funded by DEFRA through two um, programs, through uh, the Green Recovery Challenge Fund and through the catchily named Nature-Based Solutions for Climate Change at a Landscape Scale program, um, which fortunately they've renamed as Nature Returns. Um, uh, um, we've got one of the, we're one of the six pilot projects on that. And you know, that, that's very definitely looking at nature-based solutions. So whether that's from carbon sequestration or from flood risk, uh, flood risk mitigation, um, but we're also trying to look at it from a health and wellbeing point of view because relating to eco-anxiety, you know, where what we're actually trying to get people to do is to, is to get communities to be delivering nature-based solutions because that's really, you know, because it's, it's really good for a whole range of reasons. Um, where you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so I think from um, in terms of Arts, Bucks and Oxen Wildlife Trust, we're kind of doing it across multiple scales, effectively. So um, it's kind of intrinsic in everything that we do. Um, so we're looking at nature restoration primarily, as you say, but that involves nature-based solutions. So we're doing everything from working with landowners to plant hedges, to um, look at erosion control um, and stop nutrients going into waterways. And then I guess our kind of biggest project um, are in our Upper Thames living landscape, which kind of runs over to the Gloucestershire border right along the Thames. Um, we're got our Chimney Meadows Nature Reserve in the heart of that. Um, and we have, um, that used to be a commercial farm. Um, and over 20 years, um, we've kind of been developing that and restoring nature um, and putting back um, traditional floodplain meadows um, across that area. And, you know, we've been working with Floodplain Meadows Partnership um, and an Ecova funded project to look at um, how much carbon um, is being stored by floodplain meadows meadows um, as well as actually doing things on the ground so we've um, bought Duxford Old River which you're going to hear a little bit more about in a second on a video um, but this is a 45 hectare area that we've put a fish bypass through um, and we've kind of restored um, natural floodplain um, and it's meandering out spilling out over that area um, and that is now turned into one of our habitat banks um, and we are selling units um, on that. So we're kind of moving from small scale up to kind of working on site based to looking at landscape scale projects. Um, now we're looking across that whole living landscape. Brilliant. And I think that's opened up 30 kilometres of the Thames for my... Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Right. Well, we're going to cut to a, a little video of that now, actually. Very good. I wonder what happened then. I wasn't expecting then this pike to kind of come through the screen, but there you go. <laughs> okay, right, we're going to move on then. Um, so 
gaps and challenges with developing and implementing nature-based solutions. So, Helen, I'm going to come to you first, just talk about finance, if that's okay. So, lack of demand from corporate tax and regulatory issues and all that sort of stuff. That's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, after beavers, it's a hard act to follow. That was a, I can't really see from here. I'm assuming that was a beaver. Um, and, and, a, and a fish, right? There was a... No, that's not. That's a badger. That much I know. There's a badger there now. Yeah. <laughs> I meant before. <laughs> I'm not that bad. Um, so, yeah, there's... Um, as I sort of mentioned, one of the, the challenges is, is that, you know, we, the finance sector say, we've got loads of money and we want to put it to work. That's what the finance sector does. They, they look for opportunities and they put money to work. So they want to make loans to projects um, at a large scale. They're looking to, you know make some money uh, basically but there's a missing part in the middle and that is um, the companies as I mentioned earlier so you've got projects that are developing incredible um, projects that you see there who can sell into you know, sell some of those nature restoration into you would think and insurance companies for example who you would imagine want to de-risk uh, flood risk that's not the case insurance has no incentive to they're just going to increase premiums so they're out so you think okay well then who else should we sell to that might be interested and you can go around all your corporates and say would any of you like to buy it and that way you're going to create a bit of return and you'll that way you'll get the investment and they'll say well why would I there's no regulation for me to do that other than you know, biodiversity net gain, which is developers, and nutrient neutrality, also developers. So that's the problem we have at the moment. You've got this wall of money that admittedly is looking for scale. So it's looking for very large aggregated projects. It's quite hard to fund a finance a small project because the margins are so low. And then you've got quite a lot of supply, but we're missing that demand in the middle at the moment because there's no push on companies. And we can talk about how we can tackle that, I'm sure, in a bit. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Catherine, to you then. So, um, national level challenges, climate policy, integration with nature standards and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm very aware you will all have your very long lists of, of similar gaps and barriers, but I just want to mention two, um, one of which is actually, so today when we were in the, in the MBS conference, we were hearing about um, criticism of carbon offsetting, for example, that came up more than once. Um, and I know colleagues in the room from RSPB will, will um, join me in this, but actually one of the problems we have is even counting the role of nature in addressing climate change properly in this country. And it is almost certainly undercounted um, all across the board. So nothing to do with carbon offsetting, just thinking about how can we really value the role of our natural habitats in removing carbon and storing carbon. And the fact we can't count it, um, and we try, but it's always an underestimate because of the way that it's counted in the UK and, and limitations with the way the IPCC puts together the greenhouse gas inventory, that we are underestimating and, and we will go. So my colleagues at the RSPB at the back and I will go and, and try and speak to our policy colleagues and say, you're undercounting these things. And they'll go, well, give us better numbers. And then the conversation stops. So that uncertainty means that you never get over that barrier um, to trying to, to better quantify and value the role of nature in, in addressing certainly the net zero target that the UK has and then the component parts of how you think about that. It's exactly the same for climate change adaptation. So thinking about resilience to climate change, but a different problem in that really in the UK, the policy space, it's not counting really anything at all very much in climate change adaptation policy. So it's very, very high level. And there's no concept of how much you need of these things to be able to do um, that level of adaptation that we need. Now, the, again, the NGOs and others have done that analysis, but the government is behind us on that. So they're, they're running to catch up and they haven't done that level of work. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is around standards. And actually, this is an area where the UK has suddenly become very active. Um, and some of you may have experience of this as well. So Obviously, we've seen um, examples of greenwash where corporates are using the phrase MBS with nature-based solutions, but really it's nothing like a nature-based solution. Um, we've also seen a lot of trading and nature-related markets, so commod you know, commoditizing these types of values, but really they're not doing it properly. And there's no checks and balances for that. And actually now we're seeing quite a lot of activity, which is really good in the UK. So the British Standards Institute have set up uh, a nature markets group that's trying to come up with these standards that will at least help. They'll only be voluntary in the first place and really we'd like to see proper regulation. But it is a step forward to thinking about how do you 
place criteria and principles so at least we can have a framework to go out to these other organizations and say you're not doing it properly so that's a really positive you know move but still I think quite a big challenge and certainly one globally huge challenge yeah Brilliant. Okay. And and Charlotte, to you, I mean, 70% of the UK, I'm not going to ask you about UK, by the way, so it's going to be local. Um, 70% of the landscape is farmed landscape. So um, what are the challenges then locally for beginning farmers yeah. to do stuff? So um, across our kind of patch, we mirror the the national um, landscape in terms of um, we've got 70% um, roughly um, farmed landscape as well. And I think that the challenge there is that uncertainty. You know, we've mentioned that there are only um, a couple of regulated markets. And even if you look at those, you know, BNG, the amount of information and when it came versus when it came into, um, you know, into law, um, <laughs> It's just too confusing for landowners, effectively. You know, they're looking at these, they're running businesses, they're very busy people um, um, out on their farms, and they need people to understand this for them. They're going to have to pay for that service. Um, and I think the other side of it then is that it's reasonably easy these days to get um, capital payments um, for delivering works on the ground. Um, but actual revenue payments ongoing for the maintenance of that at a fair price um, doesn't come so easily. So that's a real challenge to overcome. Yeah. Okay. And just one, I'll throw one observation in from me. Uh, there are a lot of estates um, across the BBO region. Um, I mean, thousands of hectares of land altogether. And estates tend to plan on a very long-term basis. So they're thinking generations away. And actually, when you're talking about nature-based solutions, biodiversity net gain, they're thinking, oh my God, am I going to tie my assets up for at least 30 years? I'm not sure I can do that really. So there lies another challenge. And then the relationship between um, tenants and landlords as well. So a lot of the estates are tenanted and therefore it's who owns the, the, the kind of capital really. How does all that work? So given that's such a big part of our land mass, that, there lies the challenge really there to actually get stuff done locally. Um, so Matt, um, coming to you then. So um, scales of finance, securing revenue, not capital. I think Charlotte's just mentioned that, but local policy and plans for integrating nature-based solutions. Yeah, um, local policy is is also really really important. You know, local planning authorities over the last over the last ten years have been so, you know, there's such a shortage of planners that, uh, and they've had such focus on the amount of houses that they built that that anything which gets put in as a as a barrier to them delivering stuff is just regarded as a problem. So. So when we talk about, you know, when you talk about land use design and local, you know, local land use strategies and local land policies, you know, th those sort of things aren't happening because they're so because the the local local authorities are so focused on delivering the number of houses that they have to deliver. And so, you know, so nutrient neutrality, which is one of the um, mandatory markets, is just regarded by the local planning authorities as a massive blocker to delivering. To, to delivering their house building targets and it's and so you know th these things have been put in because actually they're really beneficial and they have a you know they have a significant they have a legal benefit to 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 the local planning authorities and local planning authorities don't recognize it and that you know that's not just with the local planning authorities so the environment agency you know has a uh, is dominated by engineers and so natural flood management um, is very focused on you know even the the environment agency's um, uh, natural flood management um, models are based on you know quite large scale interventions we did some work with i did some work with um, sheffield city council after the flooding in in sheffield in 2000 and, uh, 2007 um, and you know their flood models suggested that there was no no opportunity to do work which is going to impact on their their flood risk. But the top of their model was below where we'd already built tens of thousands of dams, which were which were all holding you know were all nature-based solutions. You know it was all about peatland restoration, and that, that's not recognised by the engineers in that situation. So part of it's to do with the, the scale of the intervention that the people recognizing that um, nature-based solutions can be made up of lots and lots of little things can have huge impact. 
Okay, great. Matt, can I just ask you, hopefully you'll know the answer to this, but it's supplementary. Um, local nature recovery strategies. So do they dig into nature-based solutions at all? Because obviously the biggest thing that's happening across the UK at the moment. So how far does that go to addressing nature-based solutions? They don't have to. Okay. They, they can do. Um, and we... We're really lucky in Derbyshire. Derbyshire County Council have just done a fantastic, or 18 months ago, before local nature recovery strategies were released, did a natural capital, uh, natural capital piece of work and natural capital mapping it, which is absolutely terrific, and really set the scene for them to be, be able to do, um, really set the scene for them to be able to do integrated nature-based solutions in the local nature recovery strategy. But they're not mandated to do it. And so, you know, getting them to do it is quite difficult, even though they've got this fantastic piece of work which they paid for themselves. You know, that they're and you know, they're very focused on BNG and making sure that BNG is done in the right place. But BNG is a comparatively small bit of the of the puzzle because it's you know, development's only seven percent of the of the land use land mass of the country. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think that's quite an important point. Um, right. Overcoming barriers and opportunities. Then. So, Helen, we're going to go to you first. So, how do we unlock demand? Um. Yeah. So, I think there are a couple of sort of tangible things that we could do. Um. Obviously, we need more compliance markets. We've got BNG and nutrient neutrality. We need more of those. Um. Across different sectors, not just property development. Then we have something called the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, TNFD. It's a reporting framework. It's global. Uh, and it's for companies and financial institutions to report on their nature-related impacts and dependencies. And the theory of change there is that once they start to understand any company that direct its direct impacts and also through its supply chain what its impacts are on nature that should start reducing them uh, it doesn't always end up that way with disclosures that they actually result in action but that's the theory and that currently is voluntary so of course we need that really mandated and um, so all companies are reporting then following on from that companies say well okay if i'm going to disclose and let everyone know how bad I am uh, at nature, I need to have a pathway out of it so I can show a transition. So we need nature positive pathways by sector or by system. Um, so those are kind of practical things we could do. Um, but I also think, and I, I've, I've talked about this quite a lot lately, so apologies if you heard this, but I think we need to take a bit of a different approach with nature than we have with climate. I think you know, I look at some comparisons with how we got Paris Agreement done for climate, and it was quite a different era then. And there was almost a lot of hope, you know, and, and a lot of stars aligned for the Paris Agreement. Corporate leaders came out, faith leaders, world, pres you know, presidents and prime ministers came out for it. Uh, there was youth movement, and it felt like it galvanized a lot of movement around climate and we haven't got that on nature. And I keep saying, well, you know, we should have it. And there's a march this Saturday in London and maybe that's the beginning. But actually I'm wondering if we've changed, you know, that that feeling has gone, has lost a bit. And I'd be very interested what others think. And it's very new thinking for me, but it feels like maybe we need to just be much more practical than those sort of big commitments and that hope. I think we're realizing that actually it's a bit late and now we've just got to start, just not stop talking, just getting on and doing it. So one of the things, and even just looking at the beaver, I think it was a beaver before, um, <laughs> um, like it's talking about, oh, what's the phone? No. <laughs> from, I, I couldn't tell from this angle. It's like, that looks kind of small for a beaver, but I don't think it's a dormouse. Um, so, okay, sorry. Well, anyway, were it a beaver, um, but, but that, <laughs> that we need to start maybe a narrative around... Um, Obviously, I won't be leading this movement. Um, <laughs> but we need to start talking about nature as, as infrastructure, actually, and like what it does for us. Like we did a recent report that looked, showed that what the GDP hits would be from nature degradation. It's really bad in the UK, by the way. It's already hitting us 3% into our GDP, just day-to-day -day degradation. Um, like we need to start thinking about a different narrative, especially with our politicians. Like it's nature and economic growth, it's nature and jobs. And I know that feels uncomfortable because nature, we should love for nature's sake, but I think we're in a different era. So um, a change in narrative as well. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, how do we get people to fall in love with nature? I mean, that's the surely that's the the answer to everything. But um, yeah. Anyway, okay, Sean, I'm going to come to you now. Um, so, same question: overcoming barriers and opportunities. So, what about landowner relationships, and how do we get the most out of landowners? Yeah, you mentioned, you know, locally the estate um, side of things, and I think that is an opportunity that we do have a lot of large estates across our area, and sometimes they're able to, you know, <laughs> they have the wealth um, to take some of those bigger risks and be kind of the way forward and show other people um, the way forward. A lot of farmers like to look over the fence and see what's happening next door, see that it is working for them. Um, and, you know, I think that's a real opportunity that we have certainly locally and just across um, the UK as a whole, some of those bigger projects taking place. Um, I think, again, we're incredibly lucky across um, Bucks, Bucks and Oxen that we have 15 plus farmer clusters. And I think those farmer clusters starting to look at nature-based solutions on a landscape scale um, and talking about it in those cluster groups um, is really starting to happen. And again, that's a big opportunity. We've got them in the room talking about these things um, and motivated to do it. So, um, let's give them some clarity around, you know, the financial side of it um, to really push that forward. Um, and I think, you know, we've got our part to play as well um, as the trusts. Um, you know, we're doing this um, on our reserves. We can use them. We've also got, you know, various trusts, including our own, have working farms where we're actually showing how nature can work alongside farming. So, um, opening those out as demo sites, as we so often do, and, you know, taking that to a wider audience is is a great opportunity and how we can really push forward that message. Yeah, great. Okay. And Matt, just coming to you then. So, being nature recovery led rather than funding led. Yeah. So, um, I think what the, the fantastic thing about nature-based solutions is that quite often there are multiple benefits. And so, you, uh, um, and so you can do things for one. You know, if you look at the most cost-effective way of doing quite a lot of these things, they wouldn't be any one thing. But the fact that you can pile stuff up together and when you look at it all together, you can have a significant a significant impact. So peatland restoration, fantastic from carbon sequestration point of view, fantastic from a flood risk point of view, fantastic from improving water quality point of view, fantastic from a biodiversity point of view. And all of those things together, you know, really stack up. And so, uh, you know, what we what we need to be looking at from a, uh, from a wildlife trust point of view or from our movement point of view is is what's the what's the best nature that we can get in this area and what are the benefits that that can provide that that provides and so you know i think i think there's a I think there's a serious um, risk to going down the let's chase the carbon funding on this place and let's chase the water quality funding and it, you know all of these things stack up together um, and I think that you know in order to do that we need to understand better the ecosystem services that that nature provides for us and we need we need to be we need we need to be able to explain that to um, we need to be able to explain that to local authorities. You know, that it, that all needs to be part of the local nature recovery strategies and part of the local plan so that that's embedded in... Um that's embedded in that sort of local decision-making. You, you know, it'd be, it'll be... It would be terrific. You know, my... Uh, it would be terrific if we are delivering nature-based solutions by default through local plans. And so saying, you know, th this is what we're doing here, which means that we're not increasing the risk of flooding downstream. You know, where... At the moment, you know, each each property it gets looked at on an individual basis, and so you don't look at the whole system. And thinking about you know nature, integrating nature-based solutions into the system is going to be really important. And you've got to, you've got to sort of have the national structures to do that, but implement it at a local level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then Catherine, on to you then. So um, examples. How what what we're going to do? <laughs> How do we create that evidence base? <laughs> I'm actually not going to talk about evidence too much because oh. I am doing that tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. So I'll save that bit because we've got a whole session for those of you who are 
um, around tomorrow on evidence. I'll talk about it a little bit. One thing I did want to mention, and I'm looking at Kay, who is sitting at the back. Um, now, Kay and I know each other from 20 years ago, I think, um, and I haven't seen her in a long time, and I've seen her this evening because she used to work at a brilliant organisation based here in Oxford called the UK Climate Impacts Programme. And that organization's role was to act as the bridge between the scientific community and the end users on climate change adaptation and, and equip people with the guidance and the tools and the understanding they needed to, to tackle climate change effectively. And over successive governments, a lot of those support services have been stripped away. Um, and it's exactly the same concept on nature-based solutions, actually bringing back those support services, those advice services for landowners. I mean, we do a lot of it at the Wildlife Trust, don't we? Um, Charlotte and Matt do loads of it. I don't do any of it, but but you guys do loads of it. Um, but but there isn't, you know, we're, we're doing it as charities. We're not doing it as a, as a national government-led program. Uh, and having that additional funding back again, I mean, we, you know, we're in an interesting political time in the UK. Things might look quite different. One way or another uh, in the next six months and and a lot of those old style services and support services actually I think were the absolute gem of climate policy 15 years ago so seeing that come back and having that for nature where actually we could learn something from climate policy and bring it into nature would be brilliant um, I think there's something around wider strategy work now Matt and I um, co-chair uh, the nature-based solutions part of our wildlife trust strategy so it is one of the three sort of overarching goals in our in our personal our sort of collective strategy but we are seeing it start to come in other people's strategies as well and I think when you see it start to get up to CEO level and you have enlightened organizations particularly with enlightened leadership teams very quickly things can suddenly move and if you're ready to take advantage of those opportunities and you know what you're doing you've set up your frameworks you've got your integrity criteria and you know what you're going to do and you're going to do it well you can take advantage of those and that's something I think the wildlife trusts have been very busy obviously getting ready for those opportunities quite a bit um, one particular example I just wanted to mention and we will show you a little video of that as well is our uh, relatively new temperate rainforest program, which is being funded through the insurer Aviva. Um, now, interestingly, actually it is the insurance companies that are coming to us and, and are acting as the enlightened parties and, and wanting to fund this stuff. And there is no financial return. And we've talked to the Green Finance Institute about this a lot. Helen knows all about these examples. But really, um, those of you that know Aviva and you can see what they've been doing, you know, they're doing this with lots of different organizations. We're not the only ones by, by a long stretch. But they have effectively given us, we think, the largest ever corporate donation for nature-based solutions in the UK to date to restore temperate rainforests. So this is very um, special, damp, oak, um, willow, all kinds of broadleaf uh, community woodlands in the west of the UK um, and it's a brilliant program there is a carbon component um, and I will talk about this tomorrow as well um, <clears throat> and it was interesting today hearing you know quite a lot of negativity in the room about carbon offsetting and I absolutely understand why when you're looking at it as a kind of emissions avoidance strategy but some organizations are looking at it quite differently so they're investing in nature for future um, offsets if you like or to, to balance off future only scope three emissions so only their indirect emissions once they've completed their journey to net zero which is exactly what they should be doing and that's what all the international guidance says and that that is what Aviva is doing but it's a completely untransactional relationship so we are not in a in a transaction to say we'll give you this money and we'll give you that many carbon credits they're paying for the biodiversity the community benefit the adaptation and everything else which is brilliant so we're really pleased with that example Example. The video, according to the talk we saw this afternoon on health and well-being, may put you all to sleep because it has a lot of trees in it. So we'll just see. <laughs> I've just got one more question actually for Helen. I've just popped into my mind um, about un unregulated markets. Um, kind of what's the biggest risk with those, or is it an opportunity? How do you kind of see it? What lens do you look at it through? Oh, hello. No, no. Um, the risk with with compliance markets. 
Yeah, or oh, markets that aren't yet regulated, or you know, you see lots of um, all these projects popping up. You know, biodiversity credits and, and this and that oh and the God. other. You know, how how do we navigate our way around those? Yeah, no, it's a bit. Yeah, well, we need standards as you know, as a starter. You know, Catherine mentioned for those markets. I think it's quite dangerous at the moment because we're seeing a lot of projects say, "Well, we've got biodiversity net gain, so we'll take the DEFRA metric and we'll make voluntary biodiversity credits, and then we'll sell them to companies who are early adopters of TNFD." And we say, "Why would a company that's reporting on TNFD want to buy your credits? Like, there's no bridge between it." at the moment. So we're a bit nervous because you know, we're hearing farmers say, oh, we're going to start selling voluntary biodiversity credits and we're going to make a mint. And I was like, selling to who? And so that's actually one of the challenges at the moment, just this education that it's, it's, this is going to take a while. A biodiversity credit market may or may not happen. I don't know. Um, but if, if it is going to happen, it's going to take some time. So I think that's the biggest risk at the moment. People think it's an easy, you know, we're hearing a lot. You know, farmers are going out there hearing like big numbers on BNG, big numbers on nutrient neutrality, looking at setting it up. And it's like the demand is not there, even in those compliance markets, let alone in voluntary markets. That's really interesting. Well, look, we're going to move to... Oh, I'm going to shove it right in my mouth. Um, <laughs> uh, right, if we're going to move to, um, to the audience now. So we've got a Q&A session with you guys. Actually, we're doing all right for time. So uh, we'll be five to eight. Uh, so we can let this run. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. See how it goes. Right, who's got a burning question? So chat here, and then we'll move to, to you next. Uh, yeah, coming right off the back of you've just said about the demand not being there for even the compliance markets. How, how do you square that with, say, DEFRA's 2021 analysis of the B&G markets that says that demand is going to rapidly outstrip supply over the first 10 years of the B&G program? I'm so sorry, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, back to the beaver. Um, so. I know, but I, they, they did ask me to repeat the question as well, but I'm not even going to attempt to. So, 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 it's, so what's the truth really behind the demand supply in B and G at the moment? So at the moment, so we we hear that there's going to be a huge demand, um, and I think it's put at something like 200 million a year. I think some people have said a billion, and it's definitely not going to be a billion. No in it. So um, 200 million potentially, but the challenge is at the moment, we, we don't know where that demand is. I, I find it kind of mad that we've gone down this route of markets, but you actually can't say what is the demand in the UK for voluntary carbon, nature-based carbon, and at what price are companies willing to pay? We don't know. And we actually still don't know, site-specific, what our housing demand is going to be that can then match to supply. So I think there are some nuances and there is a bit of a, is there going to be enough supply in some regions, but there might be oversupply in other regions. And, and maybe those on the ground are seeing more. I don't know if you're, you've got, no. Oh. <laughs> no. But at the moment, um, we're seeing not enough demand. Okay. Right. Hang on. There's a lady behind you that had her hand up first. Um, you could shout out to educators and what kind of NBS education would make the difference? What would you want to see? Okay, so that's MBS education. What difference would we want to see? Who would like to take that? I'll start very quickly. I think the, the teaching of how everything is connected, obviously, is critically important, isn't it? I mean, we all know that, and we've seen it time and again on nature-based solutions. Um, the fact that we may sometime possibly have a natural history GCSE, um, which has been, you know, in, in development, I think, for Estelle, you'll know. Yes. Yeah, about five years, if not more. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a golden opportunity, isn't it? But yeah. I think our early look at what that syllabus might contain suggests that, you know, we could, we could do a lot more with, with how that's looking at the moment. Yeah. And obviously, I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure, actually, whether it's definitely coming in now or it's not. It's been delayed. But, it has been delayed yeah, again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can go. I yeah, go for it. Go for it. That. So, um, so I, I, I think one of the things about the the natural history GCSE is that it's. I heard lots of stuff about it being about science, and uh, and you know that's uh, recognizing the fact that there are nature-based solutions which aren't 
about science. Where, you know, that the, there are things about health and well-being which are, you know, which there may there may be a scientific basis for how good they are. They're, but having, you know, having connection to it, making sure that the that when we're talking to people about um, about what nature is. That there's a recognition that it has it, that, that we're part of nature. We're we're completely integrated in it, and it's it's massively it's fundamental to our functioning as a, as a society, and that it's not a separate thing. You know, it, which is the it, which is the only sort of concerning thing about nature-based solutions that it's like this is a separate thing to this is a separate thing to how we function as society, rather than this is an integral part of how we function as a society. That was the only thing that I was going to say is that teaching of everything's connected and what you're saying, Matt, is this, we've got to embed these things at the start. We, it's not an add-on. You can't just bolt something on at the end. It's got to be embedded in the project from the start. Okay. Right. Lady at the front. Um, quick comment and a question. I presume you know about farming. Yes, it's brilliant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, so paying farmers to, well, for what they produce already, basically, they're not currently recognised, any of you? Yeah, so, so there are mechanisms to pay farmers, and, you know, Elms, our new subsidy regime is going to pay farmers, you know, well, you could argue definitely not enough, um, to make some of their transition. And then these nature markets are designed to bring in the pub private sector to pay and then there's a question about in setting and actually will the private sector just pay anyway but at the moment they're not paying and in particular they're not paying for baselining and that's really costly for farmers so we need either government to pay farmers for baselining or we need private sector to pay uh, farmers to baseline um and also on the monitoring and evaluation piece, I mean, that's really costly again for farmers and we're just expecting them to eat that. Um, I think there's a lot that needs to be worked out. I mean, obviously, so say the obvious, there's a lot that will be worked out over the next few years just before Elms does roll out um, and landscape recovery funding is looking at how that would work. Like, can you really blend private sector finance with public sector finance that can get farmers over the line? And heaven forbid, they might be a profitable, which is you know what, what people seem to have an issue with, that farmers actually can make some money, um, which is a bit mad at the moment. So I think it, it it's it's being fleshed out, but I just think people don't want to, like companies don't want to pay because th there's a free riding issue as well. You know, Tesco's pays for a farmer to do baselining. Who else benefits from that farmer doing baselining? Um, but also I just don't think government needs to step up, step up and start paying as well. Yeah, that was my point, is that the yeah, yeah. And maybe that will come with the next government. Who knows? Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so we're dealing with uncertainty, aren't we? Catherine? No, no. No, you don't want to. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Right. We'll move to the... Let's go to the back. Let's go to the back because we've had quite a few at the front. Lady with the green top on. Did everybody hear that? Great. <laughs> I, it's a very good question because actually, can we really measure anything in the economy properly? So I tend to find when I speak to, so I had a meeting with somebody at the Treasury um, last week and we were talking about getting a better valuation of nature. Um, just generally, it's someone I know from my previous role into spending review plans. So this is quite an important way of making sure that departments have enough money to invest in different programs of work. And 
part of my answer is I just think there's a real mental block about nature that people do use it as an excuse to push nature over to the side because actually there's uncertainty in quantifying absolutely everything that the economy does that the government does um, so that's the first thing that I don't think it should be used as an excuse not to prioritize nature recovery and nature-based solutions that being said, I think, I mean, we all know, you know, we're dealing with very complex systems. They're not human constructed systems. And therefore there is a degree of, of, of additional difficulty in measuring what those look like. And, and there's a lot of unquantifiable value. There still is, you know, and we, we all know it. There's the feeling you get from nature, the well-being benefits, the nature connection. How do you measure those things? Um, we will look at that in the main conference as we go through the week, but I think that is part of the, the problem. But other, I, others in the panel may may have interesting thoughts on that question too. <laughs> if, if, well, if not... I was just, just going to say... <laughs> um, I think sometimes we're a bit of our own worst enemy and I don't know how we get around this because nature, it just shows like, so here's an example. If you go uh, to a bank with a deal and it's for solar, they'll go, yeah, amazing. We'll, we'll finance that. If you go with a deal that's around nature, they'll say, uh, hang on a minute, where are the trees? Is it the right tree? Is it the right tree in the right place? And, you know, is anyone going to say anything? What's the community said? And everyone just goes, this is too much. Like, we just, it's, it's, why would we finance this? It's just like a headache. And then it's article after article in The Guardian, um, and I'm sure some other publications, but that's the, <laughs> that's the one that's really getting us all down, is about, about how bad carbon markets are. And you sort of say, at some point we have to move to say what there are lots of projects working that are doing good that are you know it's not perfect but they're getting there uh, and they're measuring they're doing the right things and it's with goodwill that you have to kind of say this is the trajectory we want to go on because at the moment what's happening is companies are saying why on earth would I buy carbon like I'm just going to get slammed in the Guardian at some point, and they, I mean, they are, and so we also like, should we just bring in Guardian reporters and sit around a room and say it's not all bad? Like, is that going to help? And I'm serious because actually, it's just it's another excuse for companies. I mean, they yeah. probably maybe if they wanted to do it, they'd do it. Look at Aviva, but some will just say, oh, I can't be bothered. It's too much of a hassle. Yeah. Um, it's hard enough getting it over the board. So there is there is something I think it's just you know we can't be perfect on nature, even though we want to be because we stand to lose so much if we get it wrong yeah i'm going to ask a really not i'm so, sorry i'm going to come to you in a minute another nasty question um the 40 to 90 million um, pounds that it would take to to put into nature to really start to turn the tide on it where's that going to come from <laughs> sorry i'm definitely looking at that week for you <laughs> matt i'm going to go to you actually thanks <laughs> um i, I think uh, <laughs> I'm really passionate about natural capital and understanding natural capital. You know, the, the, you can there are measurable benefits. You know, we know that there are measurable benefits. You know, I talked about a project that we've been that we're working on earlier on um, uh, nature returns. Um, you, you know, we've had some analysis done of the management plans that we've put in place and what what impact that's going to have over the next ten years. And we know that the you know the societal benefits of that. Will be about fifty-three million pounds over 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 ten years. You know those are those are actual numbers, and um, we've you know there's some really complicated stuff to do, which I we have no idea how to do about how we convert those things, which are societal benefits, into things which can go to people to make to do the sort of changes that we're doing. You know we're not talking about a massive area for that. You know those. Those are significant things which the which society is benefiting from, um, and we've got to work out a way of we've got to work out a way of of, of getting that of, of converting that natural capital into the money associated with the natural capital into things that that enable people to. I don't think it's going to be. I I, I don't think I don't think it's unfeasible for nature's recovery to be inevitable once we work out how to do you know that sort of those sort of calculations it's because it's benefit in, basically yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. because actually you look at it and you think well you know when you put in the externalities associated with the 
with the disbenefits that are happening, you know, that they're... It, it just doesn't make any sense at all. You know, we know it doesn't make any sense at all to to farm in the way that we've been farming. And, and you know, uh, the, but those externalities aren't included. And if we if we can work out a way of doing that, that will be where that money comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a whole systems approach, isn't it? Helen, did you want to say anything? I just think also, like, we're going to have to regulate companies to pay. We're going to have to get them to pay. Um, so, for example, I, I, I was talking with a supermarket um, not a supermarket, a person who worked at a supermarket um, a couple of weeks ago and um, I'm not coming off very well in this panel um, and, um, and they said um, they said they had actually costed out what it would cost to transition the, all the farmers that supply into them in, in the UK uh, and it worked out, if you can believe this three and a half grand a farm it's nothing. I mean, admittedly, they had a lot of farms, but even then, it was not a huge amount of money. And I'm, I'm dubious about this report. I'm wondering if they're just talking about decarbing their farm, and not, I, I'm, it feels like not much money. Um, and you're like, well, that's a no-brainer. You're a massive company. That's not a huge amount of money for you to do. You'd be heroes. And they said, no, because actually, what if we did it and our farmers moved to a different, uh, started supplying a different supermarket? And because there's no level playing field, because we don't have regulation, no one is prepared to be the hero, no one wants to make the move, there's too much pressure at the moment. I think this is a point like back in the Paris Agreement era, I think people were prepared to be bold and they're not now. Um, boards and, and companies and I think so we, we I think we're going to need regulation to get companies to pay yeah, yeah it's still that race to the bottom isn't it so yeah okay right question at the back uh, two parter. Uh, two parter. how much of a barrier is the bureaucracy consenting around nature-based solutions specifically scaling projects regionally or nationally and what's the role of Did you get that? I didn't hear the session. Could you, yeah, could you just repeat that again? How much of a barrier is the bureaucracy consenting demand on nature-based solution projects in scaling them regionally or nationally? Okay. And what's the role of the rights of nature movement in shifting the dial? Okay, so costs of scaling. Okay. Catherine, do you want to take that? Matt and Charlotte, do you want to take the scaling one? Shall I start? Um, yeah. So on scaling up, um, it, it, so from our perspective, it depends, or from our experience, it depends a lot on the type of nature-based solution project you're trying to do. So for the temperate rainforest program, it's actually been okay because there's a very set system in place about how you, who you have to go to when you want to plant new woodlands, where you get the money from and how it works. And that's all very nicely laid out. We understand it. We, we have relationships with those people already. So that, that is a little bit more straightforward. You still have to go to multiple people to, to get, you know, to get the, the approvals that you need. I think for other types of habitat, and this is why, I, I mean, you'll both know this much more than me. I think it, it can be much harder to do, and particularly with different types of land and landowner arrangement, I imagine it's much harder. Yeah, I think that kind of multiple landowners, especially when it comes to riparian landowners, that starts to get quite difficult. Um, and just... Um, just planning consents, but you know, county borders, looking at different planning authorities, things like that. It does all play into it. So it there is difficulty in scaling it up, but it's not insurmountable, I would say, because you know, if you've got these people together that are willing to push forward on it, we I think we can play a role and other um, charities, other organizations can really bridge that gap between us and those planning authorities to get that moving forward you know they generally all of those people in that space are wanting the same outcome luckily <laughs> more or less so we can push it forward but it is it is difficult okay. I, I think um i think it's going to be really difficult in terms of proper scaling up because of the the issues that, that Helen's talked about. Um, because, you know, for, so looking at, again, looking at our, our NFM project, you, you know, theoretically, you need to get um, 
consent from either the local flood authority or from Natural England for every dam that gets put in. And when you're, t you know, you're talking about uh, to have an impact, um, you've got to put in a lot. Um, and obviously each one of those has got, uh, you know, there's some, there's regulatory burden and an administrative burden on that. And so that, you know, that, that's going to quite quickly turn schemes which could have quite a big impact into non-profitable schemes, which is going to be the big barrier to them being, um, to them being implemented. Um, so, uh, so I think that there is an issue. And, and, and again, I think it goes back to the, it goes back to the point about, um, engineers and wanting precise figures you know that they that they don't you know that's why the that's why the environmental agencies model say what you need to do is to build a 5000 cubic meter wooden dam here rather than 10000 dams across this hillside because those 10000 dams all need uh, um consent from the local planning authority they consent from the you know and which just turns they just become ridiculous fairly quickly so i think that they are an issue i think it, 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 i think it needs to be um it, we need to get a better understanding of how of what that of how we can make those again that goes back to the nature based solutions by default um mm. people just need to let go don't they basically yeah, yeah, yeah. chill out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll go to the, the lady behind you first, and then back to you. Thank you. Um, what we've heard so far has all been very much large-scale projects. Okay, we got down to uh, farmers' clusters, which in Oxfordshire are working very well, and um, I'd like to see more of them, etc. But I'm wondering whether we need to start more at grassroots. I was really pleased to hear somebody ask about educational um, you know, syllabus for, for such things. But we can look at people's lifestyle and their gardens. And connectivity, as we all know, is very important in, in nature recovery. So look at things like local foods and, and how they can uh, you know, help with people's financial uh, standing. We've got very good community allotments in our area. Um, there are parish level um, green spaces that we can be put to good use. Uh, and there's lots of evidence on the benefits of nature from the point of view of health and well being. So, uh, and, and we know what the, another education point is how, you know, to please stop littering the place because it's not good for the wildlife and it's also not good for your financially uh, for council tax or considering how much it costs to clear it all up. I think my, my view is that we need to start from the bottom and get more people involved and wanting to do something for nature themselves. I, I personally feel that nature actually needs managing, like most things do in life. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a decent sized garden. It feels more like a wildlife -like park sometimes, because the rabbits eat this and the pigeons eat that. <laughs> And the deer, and the deer. Yeah. 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 No. 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 I, do you know, I can't even begin to repeat any of that. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, the thrust is about local community engagement and action. Okay, yeah. And um, while I can speak for a little bit about uh, the Wildlife Trust work, um, actually we're going to see a video um, at the end, uh, which is about next door nature. So that's about direct community engagement work. Uh, we have a program called Team Wilder as well. And, and whereabouts do you live? Are you in the BBO region or are you? Yes. You are? Yeah, okay, okay. So we have a... Um, a community engagement program, uh, which is a network basically that we bring together local groups and we provide a toolkit for people and actually virtually everything that you've just described and about taking local action. Um, there's a portal that you can go to, you can go to online meetings once a month or whatever, and it will bring people together to share experiences of, of what you can do to take local action. And, and we do actually firmly believe that if we can get one in four people taking for act action for, for nature locally, then it does add up to this kind of and we talk about tipping point. And I think somebody didn't like the word tipping point today in the, the lectures, did they? So maybe we don't go there. But it does, and it's all... <laughs> 
you like Tipping Point. Well, you can go on, the, on our website and have a look on there, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Maybe we need to do... Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's the best way to get you, get to you then? Because I'm sure there's quite a few people like you. What is the best way to reach you? Uh, me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. So through our consultancy, um, uh, Future Nature, we do have a community ecologist now, and we're, the plan is to reach out to all of our local parishes. And we do also through the main charity a lot of work with local parishes too. So maybe we have a conversation after. Just to say really quickly on that, Estelle, I think that's something that we're kind of really realising in within Bebo and I'm sure within the wider trust as well, that going out and engaging people in their spaces is really important, not just expecting them to come to us. And that's something that we're putting into place more and more and from every scale, from the garden and individuals, community groups, parish councils, local authorities, farmer clusters, you know, getting bigger and bigger. So, yeah. Yeah, basically. So one more question and uh, it was from the chappie in front of you in the check shirt. <laughs> so, now, I've got a question about solar farms. We've got many wonderful projects uh, happening locally, like Chimneys Meadows, I mean, these aren't solar farms, obviously, but uh, using low catchment projects we haven't heard about, but that's, that's wonderful too. We've got Farm Ed we've heard about, we've also got South Hill Solar, which we've, I've seen the best collection of, of orchids I've ever seen. And I, We've got the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. We've, we've talked a lot about the issue of finance. Uh, hello. And you said that it's very easy to get money for solar projects. Like Elms, like 10% of the local farmer, he farms, uh, his tenant farmer, we're talking about tenant farmers, he farms 2,500 2, acres of land. land. Like, the IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, tells us that solar panel will have the greatest solar power will have the greatest impact on climate change between now and 2030. Large areas of solar will therefore, for that reason around the world, but obviously in this country as well, large areas will be shifting from intensive agriculture to grassland. And We'll see connectivity there. We will see no cost to the public purse. What can we do to maximise the benefits to nature of solar farms? Okay. It seems to me like a no-brainer. The money is being paid by others, and we can benefit, nature can benefit enormously. Okay, so solar then, Catherine. I'll do a 20 second answer, but do contact me afterwards. We like solar in the Wildlife Trust. We really like local renewable generation. We really, really like solar with nature going on at the same time. So obviously you need to put solar in the right places. You can't just put it anywhere. Um, but some of the Wildlife Trusts, for example, Wiltshire Wildlife Trust are, are sort of piloting solar with wildflower meadows, all kinds of really cool stuff going on in the same site. So it's that, you know, it's that... Um, uh, that dual approach, I guess. But but yeah, we've got more to say about it. Yeah. Houses first, though. Have to go on houses first. <laughs> <laughs> and warehouses. And warehouses. <laughs> yeah. There's a, uh, there's a program at um, Lancaster University called SPIES, which I think is uh, solar panel, uh, solar power integrating ecosystem services, which is all about, which is all about that, that stuff. So, so you know, there, there's quite a lot of thinking going on around it. Very good. Anything from you, Helen? Or we? Yeah. yeah that. Okay. Very good. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw it to a close now. We are just about bang on time, but we have a, a film to show. Um, we're going to end now uh, with the Next Door Nature project, just to give you a flavour of our work in local communities. It's on YouTube, okay, or on your website. Did you get a flavour? Did you see, you know, it was actually pretty dead, denuded streets, and all of a sudden they started to turn green, and that was all about self-community organising, and yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm so really sorry about that. Bring back the water bowl quick. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, look, thank you. Thank you very much for coming along this evening. I know you've had a very, very long day, um, but I hope you've enjoyed it anyway. And, and uh, yeah, we've brought it to life a little bit for you. And hopefully in, a, in the context of the UK, we've kind of shown what is possible on some sort of scale. But actually, if I can just want, ask one last question of you guys is there hope is nature based solutions you know is it really is it the panacea or is it part of the solution oh I love it so yes there's hope <laughs> Charlotte yes there's hope but it is part of the solution not the whole thing <laughs> okay. Matt yes there <laughs> Thank God for that. I, 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 I don't think you. Could, I don't think you can do what we do without thinking. There's hope. You've you, you, there's, you've got to think. Relentless optimism is, um, is is sort of a key requisite of of what we do. Um, and I think it is the solution with everything else associated. With, you know, with other, with every with lots of other things associated with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, there is hope, I think, um, which is why we should all march on Saturday. Absolutely, <laughs> we should be there. Um, yeah, and I, I just think we need to move to a system. I'm sure this will come up again and again over the next few days of where we actually just, is, nature is integrated in everything. It's part of infrastructure, it's part of our economy, it's part of our health. It's just Absolutely. So. It's central to everything, isn't it, really? <laughs> Who's going on the march on Saturday? Anybody? Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.